properties of insulin. It makes us think about the different types of diabetes. In type 1, because of the destruction of beta cells, certainly these folks have an absolute requirement for exogenous insulin. That doesn't mean that we're not going to use other measures like diet and exercise as recommendations for their therapy, but certainly they have the absolute requirement for taking insulin. These are the individuals that are prone to developing ketoacidosis. Type 2, most often seen as adult onset, but not universally true, these are folks that have a decreased response to insulin. So over time, we manage them with diet, exercise, and oral medications, but at some point, your type 2 diabetic starts to look more like a type 1 because we start treating them with insulin. In the margin is a note called, in a nutshell, talking about insulin release. Insulin release is increased by glucose, by drugs that we use for diabetes called sulfonylureas, by muscarinic agonists, and by beta-2 agonists. Insulin is inhibited by alpha-2 agonists. Remember that alpha-2 is the major adrenergic receptor found on the beta cells in the pancreas. We have a table that looks at different forms of insulins. It allows us to compare certainly their onset and their duration. When I look at the first two drugs here, insulin Lispro and regular insulin, I want you to consider these as mealtime insulins. In other words, when your type 1 diabetic eats a meal, they need one of these mealtime insulins prior to eating. Regular has been around for a long time, but Lispro offers some advantages. Lispro has a faster onset of about 10 to 15 minutes compared to regular, which takes about 30 minutes to start working. The advantage of these drugs is rapid onset, but short duration. When you eat a meal, you want an insulin that acts quickly, but doesn't last very long. In fact, that's what the normal pancreas would do, and so that's what you use these drugs for. If you eat three meals a day, you should take three shots of a drug like Lispro per day. Glargine, on the other hand, is a type of insulin that's used as a basal insulin. Basal levels of this drug are used to maintain glucose between meals. The properties of a basal insulin, it doesn't have to have a fast onset, it just needs to last a long time. So the slow onset is not a disadvantage for Glargine, but its long duration is. So it lasts up to, and perhaps even beyond, 24 hours. The typical patient on Glargine takes that drug once a day. When you look specifically at the properties of Glargine, it's referred to as a peakless insulin. I'll remind you, the most common side effect when you take an insulin is hypoglycemia. And you are at the greatest risk for hypoglycemia when the insulin reaches its peak. Imagine giving somebody regular insulin. The drug will rise in the plasma, reach a peak, and then fall away. At the peak, that's when you're at the greatest risk for the hypoglycemic effect. So the advantage of glargine not reaching a peak is that you get less hypoglycemia. In fact, if you've ever looked at the graph for this drug, it rises in the plasma and then levels off to a plateau. It's a plateau instead of a peak, and that's why you get a lower risk of hypoglycemia. Back in general principles, we covered the mechanism of action for insulin. We know that insulin binds to insulin receptors, which are coupled to tyrosine kinases. The kinase then phosphorylates tissue-specific substrates. And certainly in many tissues, what that results in is the movement of glucose transporters to the membrane so that you can bring glucose into cells. In the margin is a clinical correlate on diabetic ketoacidosis. Make sure you can recognize these symptoms that occur in your type 1 diabetic. Polyuria, polydipsia, nausea, fatigue, dehydration, what's known as kusmal breathing, and fruity breath caused by acetone. This requires immediate treatment, typically with regular insulin, as well as fluid and electrolyte replacement. Let's look at this figure that explains the mechanism of action for sulfonylureas. In fact, this is a figure that we've referred to a couple of times previously in earlier parts of our notes. You're looking at a beta cell in the pancreas. On that beta cell, you have potassium channels that are open. That's the normal state of those potassium channels. As long as the potassium channel is open, the membrane stays hyperpolarized, and that inhibits insulin release. So let's go through the steps for how insulin is released normally 
and then we'll talk about how drugs can affect this pathway. The first thing that happens is glucose comes into the cell through GLUT2 transporters. Once inside the beta cell, glucose is converted into ATP. When the intracellular ATP levels rise, that is the signal that closes the potassium channel. When the potassium channel closes, the membrane depolarizes. That causes calcium channels to open. Calcium rushes into the cell, and that causes insulin release. In order to affect this pathway, most often the drugs are going to target the potassium channel, and that's what sulfonylureas do. These drugs block potassium channels, causing the membrane to depolarize. Calcium channels to open. When calcium comes in, insulin is released. So the net effect of this type of drug, causing insulin release. Of course, can you go ahead and predict the most common side effect for sulfonylurea, drugs that cause the release of insulin? Of course, it's hypoglycemia. The two other times that we've looked at this picture, first, when we were talking about thiazide diuretics. Thiazides, like most diuretics, are potassium wasting. Since they're going to lower extracellular potassium levels, they're more likely to cause the beta cell potassium channels to stay open. Low extracellular potassium means you've increased the concentration gradient, and as long as the potassium channel stays open, the membrane is hyperpolarized and you don't release insulin. So a side effect that we saw for thiazides was hyperglycemia. The second time we thought about this picture was with the drug diazoxide. Now who remembers what that drug was used for? An odd thing, it was insulinomas, insulin-secreting tumors, and that's because diazoxide works by opening potassium channels, which is the same mechanism as what other drug? It's the same mechanism as minoxidil. So diazoxide keeps potassium channels open and the membrane stays hyperpolarized. That inhibits insulin release, thus the use in insulinomas. On the other hand, if you don't release insulin, blood glucose will go up as a side effect. The mechanism of action of sulfonylureas was covered on the previous slide. But like we've done many times in the book, you see the entire mechanism written out for you here. And specifically, focus on the action of these drugs on the potassium channel, but know the consequence of causing insulin release. When sulfonylureas cause an increase in insulin release, you also get decreased glucagon release from pancreatic alpha cells. When you continue to use sulfonylureas, you're going to increase tissue responses to insulin via changes in receptor function. We divide the sulfonylureas into first generation and second generation drugs. But first generation drugs are either rarely used or not used at all anymore. I'm only going to mention one, and it's the drug chlorpropamide. Because of its long duration of action, its risk of hypoglycemia is much higher than the other sulfonylureas. It's a drug that also can cause the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion and also a disulfiram reaction. But I think the chances of this being a test question today are pretty low just because this group is rarely used anymore. It's the second generation sulfonylureas that are the most popular today. Make sure you know the drugs glipizide and gliburide. Also, if you look in the margin, there's a note on the drug repaglinide. This drug, which is not a sulfonylurea, but has exactly the same mechanism. It blocks potassium channels and causes insulin release. We can use this drug as an adjunct in type 2 diabetics, and we give it just before meals because of its really short half-life. When you look at the side effect profile for sulfonylureas, the first one is very predictable, hypoglycemia. And the second one, obviously is not ideal for your type 2 diabetic, it's weight gain. Sulfonylureas, while they're very important in your type 2 diabetic, have mostly been considered as backup drugs because of these two side effects. In the margin is a note on hypoglycemic reactions. Make sure you can recognize the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Lip or tongue tingling, lethargy, confusion, and sweating. Sweating is a very common side effect that patients might complain of or experience. Tachycardia, the palpitations are an important warning sign for hypoglycemia. And remember, you don't get the tachycardia if you're taking a beta blocker. Tremors, in the worst case scenario, when your blood glucose drops low enough, coma 
and seizures can result. Immediate management with glucose in some form is necessary. You can give IV dextrose if unconscious or administer glucagon. The drug metformin today is our most popular drug for type 2 diabetics. When we look at some of the advantages of this drug, it is a drug that works by inhibiting hepatic gluconeogenesis. Its specific target is glucose, not insulin. An advantage of a drug whose target is glucose instead of insulin is that it does not cause hypoglycemia. Metformin also doesn't cause weight gain. So two of the challenges we saw for sulfonylureas don't occur with metformin, making this drug very, very important for your type 2 diabetic. The drug metformin is commonly used as monotherapy, but certainly it can be used in combination with other oral medications for the treatment of your type 2 diabetic. You notice that I've highlighted the side effect of lactic acidosis. It's actually a very rare side effect. It's rare except on exam day when it seems to be a lot more popular. The patient who gets lactic acidosis while taking metformin most often is a patient who has renal dysfunction. So watch out for folks with renal dysfunction who take this drug. That's when you're more likely to see this side effect. There's also a concern if you have heart failure and you take metformin, you also have an increased risk of lactic acidosis. My clinical vignette reminds us that not only can we use this drug for type 2 diabetes, that it also may be of some benefit in polycystic ovarian syndrome to offset insulin resistance. In fact, it can increase ovulation. So remember, PCOS has an additional use for metformin. Maybe the best named drug of all is the drug A-carbose. If you remember that A means against, what is this drug against? Carbs. That's right. So it's clear to see that the target for A-carbose is glucose. In fact, specifically what this drug does is it inhibits the enzyme alpha-glucosidase found in the brush border of the small intestine. By blocking this enzyme, you're inhibiting glucose absorption. What's the advantage of a drug whose primary target is glucose instead of insulin? No hypoglycemia. So both metformin and acarbose have this as a benefit. There is a phrase in the mechanism that I want to highlight. We love to comment on the ability of this drug to decrease postprandial glucose. Because it's blocking absorption, when you eat a meal, the plasma glucose level does not increase like it does normally. Of course, a drug that works in the GI tract might cause GI discomfort. That's not a surprise. In fact, the most common side effect is flatulence. I mean, you can try the excuse, I'm a diabetic, but that probably won't work. The drugs known as thiazolidine dienes. That's a fun name to say, by the way. I call these the glitazones, pioglitazone and rosaglitazone. The glitazones are insulin sensitizers. That's a good way to summarize their mechanism. They bind to the nuclear PPAR, the peroxisome proliferator activated receptors, involved in transcription of insulin responsive genes. Specifically, the glitazones are going to increase the number of insulin receptors. That's how they're going to increase your sensitivity to insulin. Now, this is the second time that we've talked about the PPAR pathway. So who remembers the other group of drugs that works through this type of gene expression pathway? It was the fibrates. Drugs like gemfibrozil and phenofibrate. And in their case, they were increasing the expression of lipoprotein lipase. When we look at side effects for the glitazones, they certainly have a low risk of hypoglycemia because they indirectly affect insulin, mostly by affecting sensitivity. Weight gain and edema are the most common side effects. It's a reason why we avoid these drugs in heart failure patients because of the risk of edema. Similar to metformin, the glitazones could be of some benefit in polycystic ovarian syndrome, but they're most often considered as alternatives to metformin. Here we have a summary of the mechanism of action of drugs to treat diabetes. I would ask you to think about what specific organ is being targeted by the different drugs. I think often we think, well, if it's a diabetes drug, it must be targeting beta cells of the pancreas. But in fact, we've seen many other targets. Sulfonylureas work on beta cells, but drugs like metformin work on the liver. Drugs like acarbose work in the intestinal tract to affect absorption.
and the glitazones affect insulin receptor numbers in a number of tissues, including liver and skeletal muscle. Some of our newer drugs for diabetes include drugs that affect glucagon-like peptide 1. We have a drug called exenotide, which is a long-acting GLP-1 agonist. GLP-1 is an incretin released from the small intestine. And what this molecule does is it augments glucose-dependent insulin secretion. The drug exenotide mimics the action of GLP-1 and can be used in combination with other agents for type 2 diabetes. It has a very low risk of hypoglycemia. Most often it's seen when you combine exenotide with sulfonylureas. Other agents that affect the GLP-1 pathway include citagliptin and the other gliptins. This has become a family now, and so gliptin is the common ending. The gliptins inhibit dipeptidyl peptidase 4. DPP4 is the enzyme that breaks down incretins. By blocking DPP4, you're going to increase the half-life of GLP-1. This diagram does a very nice job of looking at the incretin pathway. Incretins like GLP-1 increase insulin release, at the same time decreasing glucagon release to lower blood glucose. Exenotide, a long-acting incretin mimetic, will do the same thing. The enzyme that metabolizes incretins is DPP-4. That's where the gliptins block to increase the half-life of GLP-1 to lower blood glucose. In the margin is a note on the drug pramlantide. It's a synthetic version of amylin. It slows the rate at which food is absorbed from the intestine and essentially makes you feel full, thereby decreasing appetite. Because it does not require functioning beta cells, this drug can be used in a type 1 for a type 2 diabetic. The newest of all the diabetes drugs are inhibitors of the sodium glucose cotransporter 2. We abbreviate that as SGLT2. The inhibitor that first came out was canagliflozin, but this has become a family as well of glyphlozins. So look at the last part of the drug's name and you recognize these SGLT2 blockers. This is a transporter found in the proximal tubule and by blocking this transporter you're going to increase glucose excretion by decreasing glucose reabsorption. Now that we're at the end of this chapter, let's do a summary of diabetes. For your type 1 diabetic, they need a mealtime and a basal insulin. The mealtime insulin will be used anytime they eat a meal or even anytime they take a snack. Basal insulin typically is taken once a day, for example, with the drug Glargine. The algorithm for the type 2 diabetic is a little bit more complex. You start by checking liver function tests before you begin oral therapy. If the liver is abnormal, these patients are placed immediately on insulin therapy. But with normal liver function, we then go on to check the kidneys. With normal renal function, the most common type 2 medication is metformin. But importantly, if the kidneys are abnormal, remember renal dysfunction rules out metformin because of the risk of lactic acidosis. You also want to consider the complications associated with diabetes. Diabetic nephropathy. You remember the drugs that can protect the kidneys? ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Diabetics also get nerve damage, shows up as neuropathies. Gabapentin, pregabalin or TCAs are important drugs. Diabetic gastroparesis, you can increase GI motility with metoclopramide or erythromycin. If you look at the number of test questions on this slide right here, you definitely can can get a lot of money out of this one for sure. So spend some time looking at the choices for diabetes and the treatment of the complications.